Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2018 PCORI Annual Meeting and our Friday closing keynote. Please welcome to the stage PCORI Executive Director, Dr. Joe Selby. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, this has been a pretty remarkable meeting already, and, um, and it continues. Um, we had, well, let me, let me just say first, as I'm always supposed to say, you guys are doing a great job live tweeting. I've, I've completely faded, but, um, but many of you are still going strong, so um, hashtag PCORI2018 and keep it up and thanks. And also, um, uh, this is being webcast live, so um, PCORI.org backslash live. Um, I just um, got to say that um, you know, we've had five, I think four or five plenaries. We've had 10, something like that, breakout sessions, all fabulous. We only had two keynotes this year, so that was a, um, a change. We had four last year, I think. But So I said to Bill, uh, these got to be extraordinarily good keynotes. And um, I think you would agree that on Wednesday afternoon, Amy Berman did a fabulous job kicking us off. And, um, you know, I said to her afterwards, that was, now I understand what a keynote is supposed to do, because you really pointed the way. Um, today, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce my friend and my homie from Oakland, California, Dr. Mark Smith. Don't clap yet, I've got to tell you a bit about him. I think one thing to be said about Mark is, aside from me, he may be the only Oakland A's fan in the room. If there are any others, please come up to us afterwards. Strength in numbers. Um, Mark is a, a nationally recognized health expert. Um, he's so smart, he entered the National Academy of Medicine when he was a very young man, 17 years ago. In fact, he's so smart, I, I shouldn't say this, but I'm tempted to say that he is a thought leader in any area he decides to think about. Now, if he has never thought about it, he's not one, but he's kind of like the Dos Equis man. Um, he, um, as, a, as a young physician, Mark served on the front lines of the HIV epidemic as it broke in San Francisco in the very early 1980s. He served on the faculties of both Johns Hopkins, UCSF, and also now UC Berkeley. And um, to this day, he continues to see patients in the HIV clinic at San Francisco General, at, at Zuckerberg, San Francisco General Hospital. He was the, uh, he then got into uh, uh, philanthropy in healthcare and um, served as the executive vice president at the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation for a number of years where he oversaw programs in HIV, in reproductive health, and in the healthcare marketplace. He then went to uh, perhaps his uh, most well-known gig. It certainly was uh, a lengthy one from 1996 through 2013, Mark served as the founding CEO of the California Healthcare Foundation and built that foundation up into an, a national, international leader um, in promoting innovation in healthcare delivery, in public reporting of care quality, enhancing access to care, and applying new technology. And those are areas that I really think about when I think about Mark, always looking ahead and, and on the cutting edge of what healthcare is likely to become and what it could become. He, uh, he told, as we planned over the summer for this, he told me that he was, he finally told us what he was going to talk about. And he said, I'm going to talk about performance measures and um, how we can make better performance measures. And at the time, I didn't say it, but I was thinking, oh, Mark, um, but Corey doesn't really do performance measurement. That is, that's ARC's bailiwick. Uh, and, 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 and we respect ARC's role in that. But, um, Amy helped me out there a lot uh, when she pointed out that if we've got evidence and now we want to change practice, one of the ways we do it is to get patients and caregivers into the process of developing good performance measures. You heard her say at the end that she herself was on several committees developing performance measures around people with advanced illness. So that's what we're going to hear from Mark today. I'm sure he's going to make you laugh once in a while. He'll definitely make you think. And um, so, Mark, I'll ask you to come up. Thank you very much for being here, and um, 
looking forward to your thoughts. Thank you, Joe. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Voy a hacer mi discurso corto hoy en inglés porque tenemos aquí mucha gente que tiene una disabilidad lingüística, que hablan únicamente inglés, entonces lo siento mucho. Disculpe. Um, I hate when Joe gives these long introductions. I'm reminded of the time that someone was talking to the Texas Medical Society, and they were going on and on about his papers and his honors. And someone from the back of the room said, hell, we don't want to breed him. We just want to hear him talk. <coughs> um, it is a pleasure and honor to be with you. Um, and I was uh, here for most of yesterday and very impressed uh, with what PCORI is doing. And, and we'll actually talk a little bit about some of the things that I heard yesterday that are quite consistent with my view of the world. Uh, an old teacher and friend of mine once said, when you're talking to a group of people, you should tell them what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. So this is the part where I tell you what I'm going to tell you. Um, first, I want to say some nice things about PCORI. <clears throat> I want to say something about empowerment and co-production and self-care. I want to talk about the role of value-based payment in this thing that we're all engaged in, trying to figure out what patients want, what they need, and how to give it to them. I want to take on what has become a popular saying these days, that we need fewer, better measures. And I'm going to try to convince you that that's actually not right. And then lastly, I want to talk about what I think are five tasks for the field, by which I include PCORI, but not exclusively PCORI, OK? Um, so I have to say that um, it was very impressive uh, to me how much you had fidelity to the notion of patient participation. So yesterday afternoon, when you had kind of a distinguished researcher talk about the research that he was doing, and then had a caregiver talk about the impact of that research on her and her family. When you had someone who had the condition that was being studied say, you know, we thought you needed this three-way comparison of um, surgery for obesity rather than two-way comparison, that was really impressive to me. And you should be proud of the fact that you're struggling to actually walk that talk of having patients involved in the study of their own conditions and in helping to define what those studies are. So that's one of the nice things I want to say about PCORI. Another nice thing I want to say about PCORI is that I think you actually are on the cutting edge of perhaps the most important thing we can do in healthcare today, which is to try to figure out how to spend our time and effort and money on the things that are important to patients as opposed to the things that are important to professionals. Uh, we're just at the beginning of that process. We've got several hundred years of tradition in the latter and maybe half a decade of the former. So if you haven't gotten entirely right yet, be of stout heart. We're just getting started. And I'm going to talk at the end about how difficult it is when you're just getting started. So those are a couple of nice things about PCORI. I have some other things I'll say later. But first, I have a disclaimer. Um, there are people in this room who know more about almost anything I'm going to talk about than I do. So I apologize. It's always difficult to walk this fine line between boring people on the one hand and insulting their intelligence on the other. So I'm going to say some things that will probably be wrong. In Q&A, you can correct me. Um, and I'm going to say some things with which you will probably disagree. But I have to tell you, I have to warn you, once you've had the stink eye from this guy, you little girly men don't really intimidate me anymore. <laughs> so now, how many people here believe in patient engagement? Everybody raise their hand. Yeah, no, you don't really. <laughs> what does engagement mean? Well, it might mean an arrangement to meet or be present at a specified time and place, like a dinner engagement. It might mean emotional involvement or commitment, 
Or if you're a military historian, it might mean a hostile encounter between military forces. Now, most of the time you hear people talking about patient engagement, they say they mean number two when in fact they mean number one or number three in one way or another. And I want to try to prove that to you. What is patient engagement to employers' HR department? Pay more. What is patient engagement to CMS? Fill out your health risk appraisal form. Those are patients who are engaged. And to doctors and nurses, take your medicine or eat your kale. Uh, those are uh, engaged patients. To case managers, keep your appointments. To health plan executives, stay in our networks. So everybody's kind of got a different definition of what it means to have engaged patients. I would like to propose to you that in the early part of the 21st century, our definition of engaged patients should be patients who are engaged in the co-production of their healthcare services. Now that's a rather uh, extreme notion. Uh, I'm, no, I'm, I'm known for being extreme sometimes, and I'm going to try to continue that theme and perhaps persuade you that it's not as extreme as it might at first glance appear. Um, for those of you who are interested in this, I put the citation at the bottom. It's the best thing you'll ever read on this rather complicated uh, subject. And basically what I mean by co-production is that increasingly in the last 20 years in the service industry, enabled by modern information technology, we have involved people who are being served in the co-production of that service with the people who are serving them. In healthcare, for the most part, we still have a model of a patient comes to us, we do things to or for them, and we send them back out to live their lives until they come to us again. This notion of co-production that has invaded much of the service industry is still fairly foreign to healthcare, even the most well-meaning of us. So, um, so this is part of the audience participation part of this uh, presentation. How many of you traveled here? How many of you used a travel agent to get your ticket? A few. How many of you have had occasion to get money in the last oh, month? How many of you used a teller to do so? A few. How many of you have had occasion to look for an old article or newspaper in the last month or so? How many of you used a professional librarian to do so? So if you think about the last 20 years, all of these functions in travel, in banking, in research, in shopping, we now do things that we used to pay professionals to do for us, for ourselves. We co-produce that service. And we do so in part because those industries have an economic incentive to provide the service in a way that is economical to them and convenient for us and involves us in the transaction and the service that used to be one way from a professional to us. Right? People get my idea here. So we call this self-service. Is there anybody here from the great state of New Jersey? Come on, somebody's from New Jersey. Do you drive an internal combustion engine? Do you drive one of them new fancy Tesla electronic? Do you have gas in your car is my question. Yes, who puts gas in your car? The guy at the gas station. Why does the guy at the gas station put gas in your car in New Jersey? Because in 1949, the New Jersey legislature decided it wasn't safe for you to put gas in your own car. And apparently, it's still not safe in New Jersey. <laughs> Anybody here from the great state of Oregon? Oregon. Until recently, it wasn't safe in Oregon either. Now it's safe, apparently, in some parts of Oregon. <laughs> right? So the question is, um, we, we do this now without thinking about it, although a generation or two ago, it was the expectation that when you went to the gas station, there was a gas station guy to put gas in your car. I will tell you, if you go to WikiHow, they will teach you, New Jerseyans, how to put gas in your own car. It's not that hard, I guarantee. Well, you laugh. 
but I'm about to shock you. Because when I was in training a long time ago, Joe was unkind enough to show how, just how long ago it was, if you wanted to diagnose strep throat in a child, you had to go to school for 14 years to do that. And you had to talk to the parents and feel the nodes and stick a thing in the throat and send it to the lab and wait a couple of days. Now, that process can be done in five minutes by the average well-motivated parent. Do we let them do it? No, we do not. We send them to a pediatrician, and then the pediatrician complains that she's not getting paid pediatrician's pay to do what is essentially now clerk's work. So several years ago, I used this analogy, and some of my professional friends said, well, that's strep throat, that's easy. And then I read a study about the care of hypertensives, high-risk hypertensives in the National Health Service in Great Britain, where they compared one group who had usual care for hypertension, which is pretty good in Great Britain, with another group who had been trained not only to take their own blood pressure, but to manage their own medications based on the results. Guess who had better results? The patients who co-produced the management of their hypertension. So then my friend said, well, that's hypertension. I mean, it's only hypertension. And then I read about patients who were trained to manage their own coax. And so they could both test their coax, send the results off to the lab, get the results, manage their anticoagulation medicine. They had better results and fewer bleeds than the coag clinics run by the hematologists. And my friend said, yeah, that's anticoagulation. Then I joined the board of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and they taught me about self-dialysis. Self-dialysis, where a unit has been designed where patients check themselves in in the morning, swipe a card, no nurses in the room, hook themselves up to machines that have been redesigned for them to use, do their dialysis while they're doing their email or reading the paper. When they're done, they unhook themselves, push the machine in the corner, swipe their way out, boom, on with their lives. They have fewer bleeds, better numbers than the unit run by the nephrologist next door. So then my friend said, well, hell, that's Sweden. <laughs> so then I learned about the same thing in West Philly with Medicaid patients. Turns out poor people aren't dumb, they're just poor. My point is, for everything from relatively easy medical tasks, like diagnosing strep throat, to the most complicated medical task imaginable, like dialysis, there is a wealth of capacity for co-production among our patients. Now, can all of our patients do their own dialysis? No, they cannot, but some can. And part of your job is to figure out which ones can. Now, you heard from Susanna Fox yesterday this great thing about the natural history of a new idea. Where those of you who are in the room remember this. First, it's wacko. Uh, then it's odd but unproven. Then it's true but trivial. And lastly, it's obvious. And this is often abbreviated as crazy, 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 obvious. <laughs> in healthcare, ideas like this are Wacko and irresponsible. Odd but unproven and possibly dangerous. True but trivial and requires much more proof than any of the thousands of unproven things that we do all the time and obviously needs a CPT code for reimbursement. <laughs> so my view is that this whole notion of patient engagement in the sense of co-production, where we are in the crazy, crazy, crazy obvious is kind of the end of the first crazy stage, where we're just now beginning to imagine, in part because we've seen it in other service industries, the capacity for co-production, and in part because people like you are trying to figure out and get the right instruments for measuring what's important to patients, we're moving from the first crazy stage to the second crazy stage, which is, this is interesting but possibly dangerous. I want to show you something that came from a Kaiser study of EMRs, 
<laughs> a friend of mine says they're not EMRs, they're EBRs, they're electronic billing records. Um, from the installation of EMRs and uh, phone visits in Kaiser in Hawaii. Now I just showed you some examples of how service industry has, industry has changed in order to produce a better product more cheaply and conveniently for patients. Stop and think about the fact that healthcare is, along with education, the only place left in society where we go someplace to get a piece of information. Why do we do that? Because the system is arranged such that, for the most part, the only way its practitioners get paid is if you go someplace to get that information. So this is a study that actually documents how inconvenient our go someplace notion is for Kaiser patients to go to clinic in Hawaii and travel to and from clinic 50 minutes, receptions, check in, check out, waiting room waits, exam rates, time with providers. Only 16% of the patient's time was devoted to the thing that the patient wanted, which was time with the provider. We, we have arranged our system in a way that's convenient and efficient for us and highly inefficient for our patients, particularly our hourly paid patients. Now, nobody in this room gets paid by the hour. If you have to take the afternoon off for the doctor, you take the afternoon off. For many Americans who are paid by the hour, all of this inefficiency is not only a pain in the ass, it's money out of their pocket. And yet we've arranged a system that doesn't take advantage of modern IT because, in part, our payment system is based on an early 20th century notion of what healthcare is and how it should be delivered. So I'm going to talk for a minute about value. One of the things I do is co-chair with Dr. Mark McClellan an effort funded by CMS that's a public-private partnership designed to try to accelerate the movement from volume-based to value-based care. It's called the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network. And one of the things we do every year is having developed this framework, which tries to put some precision around what we mean by value, what we mean by risk. Is it upscale risk or downside risk? Is it global risk? Is it bundled risk? We try to measure the progress of the slow, steady, turbulent, painful change of our system from a system with which we're all familiar and comfortable to a different way of paying providers. Moving from what we call category one, which is fee for service, to category four, which is population-based payment. Uh, now, no one is under the impression that all payment will ever be in Category 4, but we said three years ago when we started down this road that the future state on the right is where we thought we would and should be, with growing amounts of our system being paid for on a value as opposed to volume basis. And in fact, that's what's happening. In results that we released two weeks ago, you'll see a steady decline in category one, that is old style fee for service, and a steady increase in categories three and four, that is value based payments. But most providers are caught in the middle of this transition. They've got one foot on the dock and one foot in the canoe that is moving quickly away from the dock. Any of you who tried to learn canoeing as teenagers will know that's a very uncomfortable position to be in. And it's part of why everybody is so bitchy and crabby and upset these days, is because somebody moved their cheese. Remember that book, Who Moved My Cheese? See, so if you've been to medical school or nursing school, you've been to school for 12 years, for 14 years, and by the time you finally get to the end, God damn it, somebody has moved your cheese, you're going to be upset. This transition from a system in which, frankly, the healthcare providers have done fairly well to one in which we are paying people for results rather than efforts is a painful and difficult one for everyone to manage. But understand that relative to the conversation you're having at this conference, um, 
doctors who are in this kind of hamster wheel version of how they get paid <laughs> are not paid for things that are objectively of interest to patients. They are paid for the number of times the turnstile turns or the number of heads in the beds in the hospital. And until we can get away from that incentive system, we can't see the kind of transformation of care to a co-production ethos that I'm advocating. So if you ask health plans what they think about the future of APM, alternative payment model adoption, it is unanimous. That's the direction we're going in. Not all providers would agree. Not everyone in this field would agree about exactly what that means, but we are clearly moving away from the old system towards a new one, and that's important because value-based payment promotes modern means of communication. I happen to be a member of Kaiser Permanente. I email my doctor. My wife sends pictures of her skin to her doctor. A any of you who bank with banks that don't do electric electronic banking, uh, uh, you need to get out more. <laughs> but understand it, once you've banked with a bank that does electronic banking, you are not going back to going in to see the teller before 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon if you want to have a hot weekend. Not going to happen. And once patients get used to that level of convenience and attention to their needs, which is one of the outcomes that is of interest to them, convenience and not wasting their time and money, it will be difficult to be successful in the healthcare marketplace unless you can offer that level of customer service. The most appropriate side of care. Much of our healthcare delivery system is grotesquely over-engineered for the kinds of tasks that it provides. So the notion that you need some place that's got defibrillators and crash carts to diagnose a child's strep throat is insane. We need optimal use of non-physician professionals, and I don't need to tell this group that there are many tasks in healthcare that can be done not only more efficiently, but with better quality by non-doctors doing them. And we need shared decision making by fully informed patients. And one of the ironies, as you know, and there were a number of examples yesterday, is that for the most part, not always, not everywhere, but for the most part, fully informed patients actually choose a less intensive style of care than that would otherwise be provided by professionals, from asthmatics to people who are dying. But our volume-based system is a barrier to this. So, Back to the article I told you about. The authors suggest that there are four opportunities for action to have better co-production of healthcare service. One, education of professionals and the public. That's what we're doing here today. <laughs> Two, healthcare system redesign, which is part of the infrastructure, the purpose of what you do and what practitioners and managers all over the country are struggling with. How do you redesign a system trying to put the patient at the center of it? Any of you who have ever done lean training and seen string diagrams and following people around trying to say, why do we make patients walk in this crazy circle? Why are we doing that? People are actively trying to think about how does this work from the patient standpoint rather than our own convenience and efficiency. Redesign outside and at the edges of the healthcare system. This is what often in my view is now called social determinants of health. They are not social determinants of health, by the way. I know I'm not going to win this war, but any of you who read Rudolf Virchow, social determinants of health are poverty and residential segregation and unemployment and racism and gender inequality, not can you get a cab or do they have fresh vegetables nearby? Probably better called health adjacent social services. But my point is people are now actively engaged in trying to think beyond health delivery system to what adjacent social systems impact health status and use of health services. 
And the reason they are doing so is because they are no longer being paid just for the number of nights, the host patients in the hospital, but being paid increasingly to keep people healthy and are forced to realize there are all these other things that are involved in keeping people healthy. And then lastly, they say one of the things that's most important to work on is measurement of good health care, which brings me to measures. Now, we often talk about these dichotomies and measures. There's kind of process and outcome. There's objective measures and subjective measures. There's patient-centered measures and clinician-focused measures. And there are clinically specific and generally applicable measures. Um, my sense is that the things that are most important for us right now to redesign this healthcare system are the ones that are patient-centered and clinically specific. The reason patient-centered is because we have all sorts of things that are important to doctors and hospitals and CFOs and CMOs. We are just now learning how to create robust measures that are important to patients, and I believe those measures will only be compelling to patients and their doctors if they are clinically specific. So when I hear people say we need fewer better measures, my response is, no, we need more better measures. Everybody here is familiar with the complaints of providers, I think legitimate ones, that there's a terrible burden in our current system of measurement. But the answer to that is not a search for five magic measures that will be useful to a 34-year-old man with HIV, a 71-year-old woman with a hip replacement, a 26-year-old woman with newly diagnosed multiple sclerosis, and a 56-year-old woman with atopic dermatitis. I know all four of these people, me personally, in my life today. Yeah, there may be a few things that they share in common. They'd all like to get information more conveniently. They'd all like to have good communication with their doctor. But when it comes to clinical measures, my patients are not particularly interested in um, their hips work just fine. Thank you very much. So this, this search for a few good measures uh, that will really grab patients and doctors, I think, can only happen if they're clinically specific to the conditions at question. So, what is the curse of measurement that we face right now? What is it that leads people down this false path of fewer measure? First, we know it's possible and important. It's part of what you are increasingly doing. Second, the current measures are imprecise and often not compelling to patients or professionals. Third, our IT systems are so primitive that the burden of collection, analysis, and reporting is substantial. But the answer is more measures, more clinically specific, with greater integration into workflow. There's not a modern production process in it that exists other than healthcare where our system for monitoring the quality of the process is a differently established and funded system from the process itself. Now, I understand some of you make a living setting up these processes to monitor these things and shutting them down and setting them up and shutting them down and setting them up and shutting them down. But PCORnet is kind of the future, <laughs> right? We have to integrate the process of measuring quality, collecting information from patients with a view towards the ergonomic and economic integration into the workflow. So I now have five tasks for this field. One, continue to work with providers and patients to develop robust, clinically specific measures of quality. Two. Accelerate the integration and automation of quality measures into the workflow of care delivery, as opposed to being a separate flow of funds and work and personnel. Three, develop instruments to measure and improve the self-care capabilities of patients. Figure out which of our patients can manage their own hypertension, can manage their own anticoags, can manage their own dialysis and to work with the industry on developing enabling technology, just as the banking industry and the travel industry and the research industry have done, 
to allow lay people to do tasks that are now done by professionals to co-produce healthcare services. Four, <laughs> to think about non-creepy ways to use social media, search, shopping, and other non-health data to inform our care of patients. So you think about it, you, ma'am, if we put together what Google knows about you, what Amazon knows about you, what Target knows about you, what Facebook and Twitter know about you, they know a hell of a lot more about you than your doctor knows about you. Now, I know that's creepy. That's why I said non-creepy. I get there are privacy concerns. There are all sorts of concerns. But we need to be thinking about, we understand those of us who've watched the news recognize that social media, like nuclear energy, can be used for good or ill, right? So I'm not talking about creepy ways. I'm talking about non-creepy ways of trying to integrate this profound, deep knowledge that exists about you, your hopes, your fears, your tendencies, your concerns, your predilections, into our management of your care. <laughs> At the foundation, we built the California Healthcare um, uh, Joint Replacement Registry, now integrated into the American Joint Replacement Registry. And the single biggest problem we had was these clipboards. We ought to ban these damn clipboards. It's 2018. The notion that we got people running around with pressed wood, with smashed wood fibers, and a thing with indigo trying to ask patients, so how, really? 2018. The process of trying to figure out how you efficiently, seamlessly, economically collect the kind of patient-generated information that is necessary for us to know not just how many readmissions for surgery happen, but how is the patient's pain six months later is a pressing task that needs to be instrumented. And here's the fifth task, to develop, promote, and deploy more flexible, nimble, adaptive research methodologies. I was a foundation executive for 22 years. And in foundation work, some of you are foundation grantees, much like government work, the way we approach research is we define clearly, specifically, and immutably what you are going to do for the next three years. You change that, you need to get written permission from your program officer, right? Because you've defined ahead of time what you want to do. I now serve on the board of a number of startup companies and advise venture capital firms. They have a completely different ethos. You have an idea that you start with and you run into a roadblock and you back up and then you redesign and you try some. It's the search for a sustainable business model. I'm not suggesting that we don't have clinical trials, that we don't have rigorous research, but in this world that we are just learning, we're at the very early stages, we have to have ways that people can be more adaptive, more flexible, more nimble in trying to understand what's going on and find successful ways. So um, this is all theoretical, to tell you the truth. I, I'm up here talking about it, but we're trying to figure out how to do this. One of my favorite philosophers, Yogi Berra, maybe, it's never clear whether Yogi actually said these things that they say he said, but maybe he said, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. <laughs> so a commonly quoted guy in Silicon Valley these days is a guy named Field Marshal Helmuth Karl Bernhard Graf von Moltke, otherwise known as von Moltke the Elder to distinguish him from his nephew, von Mulkey the junior, who said, the tactical result of an engagement forms the base for new strategic decisions because victory or defeat in a battle changes the situation to such a degree that no human acumen is able to see beyond the first battle. Simplified as, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. Or, as Mike Tyson once said, everybody has a plan till I hit him in the mouth. 
So you got to have a plan, but you can't stick to that plan for three, four, five years, the length of the grant, once you know after two months that's not working the way you thought it would. You have to be able to adapt, to, to change, to be nimble enough to push forward in these new experimental areas where you find success. That's a bit of a conflict with our traditional wreath church ethos, and we've got to find a way to maintain rigor while providing the nimbleness and the adaptive capability that's necessary for us to succeed at this frontier of the unknown. So this is where I tell you what I told you. I said some nice things about Picori. I talked about empowerment and particularly the notion of co-production of healthcare services as opposed to a one-way acting on patients, patients' active involvement in what has hitherto been the professional domain of professionals. I talked about the role of value-based payment as an enabling environment for the further elaboration of this notion of co-production. I talked about the fact that I think for this environment to succeed, we will need not fewer but more better measures. And the way to relieve the burden is not by thinking we will find five perfect measures that apply to all patients and their providers, but by modernizing the system, automating the system, integrating the system by which we collect, analyze, and report those measures. And then I have five tasks for the field, clinically specific measures, integration and automation into workflow, measure um, and improve the, the capacity for self-care of our patients, non-creepy ways to make use of non-health data, and finally, flexible adaptive research methodologies. I want to end on an up note. I'm an AIDS doc. I saw a patient two weeks ago who's 74 years old. Been seeing him for a decade. He's on one pill once a day for his HIV. Most of you take more medicine than he takes. For those of us who are at the beginning of this epidemic, it's really nothing short of a miracle. So whether you know it or not, on the biomedical side of our field, there are amazing things and there's more amazing stuff coming, but we need to figure out a way to organize a system that can deliver those biomedical miracles and that can have that system rooted not in how fancy the molecule is, or how uh, intriguing the technology, but what it actually does for patients. So it's been a pleasure to see how much in the forefront of that you are, and I thank you for your attention. I told you he was smart. Huh? <laughs> Thinks about a lot of things, but um, even Mark said that uh, there's probably pe people in this room that know more about any specific topic than he does. So now's the time when you can, uh, you can set Mark straight. You can, he flew all the way out here. You can teach him something. Or if you just want to ask him a question and get him started thinking on a new topic, you can, <laughs> you can also do that. And together, we're going to try to fight the lights and look for people who are standing up and waving and asking questions. This is the time to ask questions. Have I so stunned you into silence that, uh, that nobody has so, asked us? So Mark, I, I have one question for you while they're transporting the mics around, and I think I already heard the next question ready. But um, this is kind of cool idea, this idea that patients and, and, and clinicians and delivery systems sit down together to figure out what are the, you know, what measures should we use to measure healthcare systems and, and clinicians, et cetera. Um, where does this take place? Where do you see this happening? I think that is part of the work of PCORI. I, I am not from the school of let a thousand schools of thought contend in measure application. I think providers and patients ought to be empowered to figure out how to deliver care best in their environment. But I'd like to be able to compare the care in Wilkes-Barre to the care in Toluca to the care in San Diego. So I think we need, there is a scientific enterprise here in the development, validation, promulgation of valid, robust measures of patient-centeredness in the delivery of clinical services. And that's part of why I think the PCORI work is so important, is because <laughs> you don't want everybody out around the country defining their own measures. They need to define how to best deliver care in their environment, but they need to be held accountable to a 
generally accepted set of measures, and I think that's a scientific task. Thanks. Okay. I, I have a there we question. Go. Don't um, see you, but I hear you. Can you hear me fine? Okay. Just fine. We can hear you. Can't see you, but. Okay, yeah. I'm, there you are. There you are. So I'm affiliate faculty at UCSF, Kim Jeanette, and um, work for the Center for Workforce Health and Performance. Um, so we're looking at value-based outcomes that allow longer and healthier working lives. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very interested in your thoughts on multimorbidity and when we're developing these clinically specific measures to try to get at value, how do we do that in a way that doesn't continue to double down, down specialty lines that aren't taking into account a holistic patient perspective that increasingly may have multiple chronic conditions? I think this is a highly individual question and that's part, th this is now increasingly the role of doctors. So if we don't need doctors to diagnose strep throat, what we do need doctors to do is to take someone who has three or four medical conditions, each of which has a set of guidelines for treatment individually, which conflict with each other, right? And we're trying to figure out what this, this, beginning, this meeting began with, what matters to the patient, right? What matters to this particular patient, right? Is it more that that patient is concerned about shortness of breath? Or is it that more that that patient is concerned about chest pain in our efforts to kind of harmonize and balance the risks and benefits of different medications and focus on different diseases? That is increasingly, I think, the task of physicians. So uh, part of the problem, for those of you who are clinicians understand this, is that many of these diseases have guidelines that are well worked out if that's the only thing you have. But if you have congestive heart failure, or mild renal function problems, you've probably got something else too. And so beta blocker, yes or no? Well, it depends. So I, I think I, I, this also has scientific work that has to go on, but I think increasingly this is the task of physicians, is to integrate what are conflicting um, impulses, conflicting guidelines, and to work with patients to figure out what matters to that individual patient to try to uh, make those decisions. I don't know if that answers the question. Hi. Um, Hi. Ar Arlene Bierben from AHRQ. Thank you for that great talk, Mark. So I have a question. We've, it's something we've been struggling about. We know that the, there's a lot of echo. Um, we know that the traditional way of doing trials doesn't work because you don't want to do something from five years and get a negative study. You've just wasted your investment. And we've been struggling with how we can do more innovative research, complex adaptive trials, and, I, and I'd love you to like elaborate a little bit on your last point. Yeah. Well, I think we're almost there um, because it requires first the digitization of the healthcare enterprise. And again, it, it is not all that long ago that most of healthcare data was stored in what is literally medieval fashion. I'm talking about vegetable pigment on smashed wood fibers literally medieval. So it's only really in the last decade that we've laid the groundwork and the infrastructure to be able to do that. Um, there's still a lot to be done in the um, digitization and organization of outpatient medicine. So hospitals, pharmacy data, lab data, all that stuff is available, but doctor's notes, physical exam, uh, even um, uh, signs and symptoms in the outpatient setting, is still largely the province of purpose-built studies. So I think that's the first prerequisite. But I also think it requires probably an investment by government along with uh, private systems. Kaiser Permanente, Intermountain Health, a number of others have invested a fair amount in having the capacity to use this data to both understand care and improve care. So I think you know we're almost there, but that's a prerequisite. It also probably requires a change a little bit in the professional incentives of the researchers. Um, I'm going to get touchy here. I, no, as a, I'm, as I'm a with former you. medical school faculty member, um, you know, if your lifeblood is writing grants and there's that 65% overhead that comes to the department and the dean and all that, and there's a three-year grant, and I mean that's 
you know, that's kind of in your professional interest. Part of what we need to do is to establish support for people who run the capacity, right? They're not getting funded $2 million for four years to ask and answer a question, which then gets shut down. They write another grant to ask and answer a question. There's got to be an integration of our support for the infrastructure with our support for the professional advancement of people whose expertise is developing and maintaining the capacity to answer questions that come up de novo, as opposed to having the funding tied to answering a specific question. Now, I know you're doing some of that, and ARC is doing some of that. I think that's kind of the way forward in that. We're even doing some of that together. Yeah. There's a Twitter question, but I think, Mark, you might have just answered it. What's the most important first step to making our measurement more nimble and adaptable? I think subliminally you uh, were Yeah, I think the most important first question. step is to complete the digitization of the healthcare enterprise, without which all of this is just impossible, impossibly inefficient, impossibly uneconomical. Hiring you know, armies of research nurses parading around with clipboards is not the way we're going to do this. So that's first we have to complete that. Second, we've got to complete the process of making these records interoperable. And I am told by people who know more about this than I that APIs are the, the next big step to doing that so that um, you don't find that this system has Cerner and that system has eClinical Works and that system has Epic and even this Epic won't talk to that Epic and all of that Michigas that happens. So, um, that's another kind of prerequisite to being able to do this economically. And then I think you have to have this capacity to ask and answer questions on demand in a way that can um, improve the delivery enterprise without having to set up purpose-built separate work streams for it. Question over here. Thank you for that inspiring talk. Jun Mao from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I, I feel like how healthcare system developing effective intervention is very different than technology sector develop very useful and scalable tools. Uh, do you feel like we are ready for a new scientific discipline? It's almost like innovation health science that have this through the rapid iterations of developing things that are useful and scalable for patients. Uh, in addition to traditional, more conservative, slow, methodolo methodologically really tight kind of study, because I, I find it's challenging in the IRB and in all sorts of uh, ways. Like six months, you wouldn't even go through IRB, let alone developing any iterations of new interventions. Yeah, some of it is IRBs and all that. But if you've been to San Francisco lately, there's no shortage of innovators. I mean, there's a, every, you can throw a rock in any direction, hit a 27-year-old that thinks they're going to change the world. <laughs> um, the, 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 the main problems here, in my view, are not technical. They're business model problems. So we've been able to do remote physiologic monitoring for a decade. Hasn't been widely adopted. Why? Not a technical issue. It's a business model issue. It's because the doctor's office doesn't have staff to manage this data. And no, the doctor's office was paid when the patient came in. There was no incentive to adopt. So it's part of what I meant when I said change in the payment reimbursement system is part of the necessary environment for the uptake of modern IT. Because for my, for my money, the principle, there are some, certainly the research enterprise that's academically based could be modernized. But my sense is the main obstacles to, op to uh, innovation in healthcare are more business models and less technical issues. You did it again, Mark. You answered the Twitter question before I read it, so that's good. Uh, right out here. Hi, my name is Linda Starnes, <clears throat> and I am here with a PhD in family caregiving, um, which means I've got a lot of lived experience. I'm here representing uh, Step Up the study that's looking at special health care transition for those in the pediatric side trying to move into the adult services. Mm -hmm. And my question is, well, first of all, I want to just expand on that whole idea of co-production. I've been in co-production um, production on the health care side from the day my son was born and came home on a ventilator with a trach and a feeding tube, central line, and insurance didn't cover for 24-hour care. So the training was me 
and running everything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that continues today in mm -hmm. some degree. He is trained. He is his own co-producer in self-care, and he's a college graduate. Yeah, good for him. <laughs> Still with a trach and a feeding tube. Uses assistive technology for communication, but we got there. But my question is, I am still called mom when we go together to doctor appointments. Mm -hmm. He's still in pediatric care. Mm -hmm. And um, we still are working with clipboard folks. And we are constantly working towards being um, the trusted voice in co-collaboration and co-production. Mm -hmm. So I, I would love a raise of hands. How many people have been in co-production like me as a family caregiver? But we're still knocking at that door of collaborative trust. And what can you talk to us about who are the patient and family advocates in the room? Well, um, I think there are a couple questions. One is, how do we create an environment that incentivizes better attention to that question? And then, how do we actually pay better attention to that question? I think an, an environment in which we are monitoring patients' satisfaction with care and comments on care. So if your providers, um, every time you, I don't know about you, every time I fly, I get a survey from United Airlines that how'd it go? You know, what did you think? Was the plane clean? Was it? So now we can be over surveyed, but if, if every time you went and had a less than excellent experience, you had an opportunity to feed back to somebody, we had a less than excellent experience, that institution would begin to now have, and those providers would begin to now have an incentive and some data with which to manage their behavior better. Um, there are a variety of ways in which patients can be involved in the design of care. I've seen um, lean work in which they've invited patients, uh, patients, family members, unrelated staff from different parts of the institution to be part of redesign teams that have brought tremendous insight into how people could do stuff better. So I think there's the technical capacity to do better work there. I think part of it is, um, again, a reimbursement environment and a, a way of routinely and seamlessly gathering feedback from patients that lays bare these issues so that people at least, it is at least brought to their attention, because they all mean well, right? It's at least brought to their attention that although from their standpoint, they're doing God's work, it doesn't feel quite that way from the other end, I think is part of what we have to do, which is part of why I said, we need your help to figure out how you actually integrate that work into the workflow of healthcare systems so it's not another task. Um, how it is people can routinely, um, in the Singapore airport, they have like a green button and a red button in the bathroom. If the bathroom's clean, they ask you to push the green button on your way out. If there's something not so right, you push the red button on your way out. There have got to be ways in which we can, um, uh, without pr presenting a huge burden, get better, more regular, uh, more lightweight ways of getting that kind of feedback so at least um, some attention can be can be paced on it. Okay, we got, we have, there's two people that have been standing for a long time. If you can make your questions concise as possible, I think if we can I, squeeze can them make, in. If I can make my answers. Oh, uh, that's, no, you can do your answers um, as long as you want. Um, okay, in the middle. Uh, good morning, Mark. Uh, good thank morning. you very much for an enlightening presentation. My name is David White. I am a a, the a chair of PCORI's advisory panel on patient engagement. I also happen to be a kidney transplant recipient, and I spent six years of dia on dialysis. So uh, your uh, self-dialysis, uh, that's to say that I perk my ears up would be an understatement. Mm -hmm. um, and there are pockets, very small pockets of that in Philadelphia, also in Texas, but yes. let me get to the question. In this population, um, we don't know that we have a choice and we don't know that we have a voice. Mm -hmm. What do we do about that? Well, I think largely you don't have a choice. <laughs> that was my point. Again, I started by saying, do I think it's appropriate for all patients to do their own dialysis? I don't, but I think some are. So 
first, there has to be more capacity to handle patients who are at different levels of capability. And second, there has to be more attention to designing processes and devices, which is part of one of those tasks is working with industry. Um, ATM machines are built for us, for lay people, not for bankers, right? Orbits is built for us, for lay people, not for travel agents. <coughs> Similarly, as you know, I know you know, um, the machines that they use in the self-dialysis units have been modified. They used to be assumed that professionals were using them, but now they have to be modified for lay people to use. So my sense is that throughout healthcare, for dialysis, for wound treatment, for all sorts of things for which we now need professionals, a concerted effort to say, first, how could we make this more usable by lay people? Second, how do we figure out which lay people can use it? Third, how do we move people along that spectrum of capability has to be part of the task. And um, some of this is solved by these methods of asking people, but some of it, I think, probably requires a top-down decision that we're going to make this a priority, that part of PCORI and ARC and NIH and other governmental funding is going to be to move these tasks down the professional ladder to give patients more choice. Uh, and that's part of how stuff gets done in this country, is you say, this is going to be a priority. We're going to fund this priority. And when there's money available, people will, will go do it. OK. The lady at the, on the left. Yes, my name is Stella. I am from Florida. I represent an organization which is working in the community to try and get the evidence in the hands of the people. Mm -hmm. You know, what you say today will resonate with me for a long time. Because when it comes to co-production innovation, um, the question is asked, has this been done before? Mm -hmm. So I believe that most of the brilliant ideas stop right there, mm -hmm. where you are supposed to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the idea you have indeed will work. Mm -hmm. You know, I say this for a reason, because I grew up in Africa where my mother taught me very well to eat everything on my plate, because people in Cuba were starving. <laughs> However, when I realized I was 335 pounds, I said, wait a minute, I'm not feeding Cuba here, I'm feeding me because the pipeline ends here. And this, you know, as a professional, I'm a clinician, I'm a physical therapist, my physician kept telling me, you need to lose weight. If you don't lose weight by the age of 50, you'll have both knees replaced. But my physician never told me how to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm 49 now, and I don't have knee replacements yet, and I have no pain. So I had to find my path. And I live here in America, as I go around churches talking about the same message of wellness, people tell me that they were told by their parents to eat everything on their plate, because people in Africa were starving. So I'm spending most of my time trying to convince people in America that food doesn't go to Africa that way. It's a behavioral change. <laughs> So one of the reasons why I had to stand up here today, because three years ago, I came to Picori. And when I got to the airport, <coughs> the blue vans were there. I got on one of them to come to Crystal Gateway, wherever the meeting was. I paid $30 to ride with other people on this blue shuttle. Mm -hmm. However, when I got there this year, I looked around. There were no blue shuttles. I never used Uber before. So right there at the airport, I had to learn how to use Uber. I had to trust that my credit card would not be messed up with. Mm -hmm. And I rode, I you know, came here through Uber, and I paid $17. Mm -hmm. So innovation has led us there where you can actually see the driver come to you, and you can see where you're going. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, how long will it take for the evidence to be in the hands of people? As a clinician, if I want an article, I have to pay $30 for it. So from an advocacy point of view, I am a subject in a research, but when it comes to the results, I have to pay for them. So until we can get the evidence in the hands of the people and help people not to depend on Google and YouTube to make decisions, but to make decisions based on best practice. Thank you. Well, there's a lot there. First of all, dicen que los cubanos tienen tanta hambre que comen los FF. Um, first of all, your doctor didn't tell you 
how to lose weight, because as those of you who are doctors know, nobody taught us in medical school. Uh, it's, it's an under-taught under, uh, area. We know a lot about the Krebs cycle, but not a lot about, yes. about that. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I saw that Aaron Carroll was one of your speakers on Wednesday. I missed him, but he's done a tremendous job in helping to lay bare the fact that there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of back and forth on the subject of nutrition in among the public, a lot of um, uh, misinformation and a lot of faddish information. It's one of the things that healthcare organizations need to get better at. Um, and again, if, if your doctor or your organization is being paid, uh, in, I don't know if it was true in your case, but often being overweight will correlate with other measurable health problems like blood pressure and hemoglobin A1C. If your healthcare organization is being paid every time you come, no matter what your blood pressure is, every time you come, no matter what your hemoglobin A1C is, then although I'm sure they care, they don't have a corporate institutional incentive to figure out how to actually get you to lose 30 pounds. If they are now paid on the basis of how well your hemoglobin A1C is or how well controlled your blood pressure is, doesn't make it perfect, it doesn't do it automatically, but at least you've now created a financial environment we were talking about the Oakland A's. Yes, Chicago did. Cubs, Boston Red Sox are people who learn their smarts from Billy Bean, the general manager of the Oakland A's. It turns out smart versus smart and money. <laughs> smart and money wins every time. So it turns out in the case of healthcare organizations who would like to see their patients get healthier, meaning well versus meaning well and getting paid for results, I'll take door number two. It's part of why I spend my time working on this value-based thing, as messy and difficult as it is, because if the doctors you're going to, the healthcare organization you're going to, is now paid in part on whether you actually have control your blood pressure and hemoglobin A1C, one way of which is controlling your weight, you've now got more brains at work trying to figure out how do we have group visits? How do we have a diabetes education nurse? How do we have a nutrition program that people can sign up for that's actually based on evidence, as opposed to just relying on the best of intentions of overworked doctors on the volume-based hamster wheel that I showed you a picture of? That's the best I can do. So um, Mark, you, uh, you didn't fail to provoke. This was a, a, a really provocative uh, um, presentation, giving us a lot to think about and, and actually uh, directions to move forward on it. Pakori, you said you had other thoughts about Pakori, and maybe uh, some of that was in, in these, the messages you've given today. Um, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. We're going to take a break. I have a feeling we're going to pick up on this exact theme when we come back here at 9.30. Uh, to talk about how systems take evidence and put it into action. So, see you then. Very smooth.